upon observing. I mean, I, I see often this astronomy and science in general, like you're putting pieces of the puzzle together yeah. to get a, a really good view of the whole picture. So that's what we're doing. I mean, and it's, that's beautiful. So thank you both so much for such a great introduction to you know, Webb's last year in science. And we are already getting so many great questions <laughs> in online that I'm gonna take a step back mm -hmm. and I'm gonna toss it to our viewers. So for those watching, remember to send in your questions using the hashtag AskNASA or drop them directly into the comment stream wherever you're watching. All righty, so our first question is from Instagram user Trevor Morea. So he has a question about the anniversary image. He asks, this is a, is, this is a multi photo stacked on top of each other of different wavelengths mm. of what each camera sees, correct? Um, this isn't what it looks like to the naked eye, basically, is yeah, what, yeah. 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 Can I take that one? Sure, go ahead. Okay. So <laughs> we like that let one. Me break down. <laughs> let, me, let me demystify this, okay? This, there's really not pulling a fast one here. We take, so this is all one camera, this is the near cam instrument. And with that camera, we do two colors of light at once. Okay. We, get a, we get a twofer, a buy one, <laughs> get one free, which is useful. <laughs> and so, but when you get the raw data, and you can download the raw data from, um, from a telescope. You can go look this up for yourself. The raw data are gray, right, where it's more light, less light. It's monochrome. But you can look at the raw data, and it looks a lot like this. What we do to make the, these really gorgeous images is we give them, we give the data a spa treatment, right? I mean, we make them look their best, we clean them up, but they still look like themselves. Mm -hmm. We're not doing anything to really change what's going on here. Mm -hmm. We just kind of make it pop. Yeah. And so what Add we're some blush. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's a little bit of like, but but it's we're not. There's no. There's nothing. You can look at the raw data mm -hmm. and see everything that you see in this image. What we basically do is assign colors that our eyes can see to different um, colors of light that Webb is detecting. And so we try to do that in ways that make physical sense. So in this case, we've assigned the yellow color to, du uh, to dust, um, to uh, emission from uh, smoke, from little pieces of smoke. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we're, we're assigning red to molecular hydrogen. And so we can be flexible, because of course we can't see the infrared, yeah. but there's nothing magical about our eyeballs, right? My cat can see further in the red than I can, and <laughs> bees can see further in the blue than we can. Telescopes allow us to see past the limitations of our own eyes, and then we map them into what we can see so that we can make sense of it, because we go through life in, in color, and so that you know, astronomers do that when we're when we're analyzing images. We make three color images yes. so we okay. can help see. Okay, what am I looking at here? What's going on? Wow, I mean, that is just incredible. And you know, it really I feel like brings out that merger of art and science in a it way. It definitely does. And so that's so cool. So on our next uh, Twitter user asks, Reg Victor's. Um, he's asking a question. If the Webb Telescope can look with such detail at the very farthest reaches of the universe, can it see with extreme detail what is in our own Milky Way galaxy? Basically, if it can look so far away, you know, does that mean if it mm -hmm. looks a little bit closer, can so it see with really, really great detail? And he has an example. Can it catalog solar systems and the detailed compositions of the bodies orbiting them? So for, so yes. To answer the question, yes, certainly we can study and we are studying uh, our own galaxy. And actually, this uh, image was released today is from our own galaxy. It's a really close star from the region. So yes, we are studying planetary systems like TRAPPIST. I mean, they are really far away. So what we see with these planets is maybe if you see the planet, you see a dot. Mm -hmm. You don't see, you know, these beautiful renditions that are more like art than anything else. But yes, we study them. We do direct imaging. We do a rainbow with the data and with that rainbow we get all the chemical composition and we can characterize them. So, so far we are studying for outer solar systems, let's say, or solar exoplanet systems, the planets themselves. Mm -hmm. We haven't started yet doing any sort of other body there, but yes, we can certainly and are studying our own galaxy. Well, I mean, that just leaves us excited for what's to come, right? <laughs> you know, it's only the first year. So Astroza on YouTube asks, will JWST try to find distant quasars? Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've already found we a bunch. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, in the first year, we, tar we targeted some quasars we already knew about that were discovered by other telescopes. And there have been recent results out studying those quasars, and in particular, wanting to understand. So these are supermassive black holes. A quasar is a name for a black hole with the mass of up to a billion, with a B, solar masses worth of stuff in a black hole that's about the size of our solar system. Wow. That's at the heart of a galaxy. Every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in its center. Big galaxies have big black holes. Small galaxies have small, gal small black holes. We is don't a really quasar a supermassive black hole? A quasar is a good question. A quasar is a supermassive black hole that is feeding, that is wow. accreting gas down it's onto it. Right? <laughs> yeah, and so it's fueling, it's getting bigger. Yeah. And of course, once matter falls into a black hole, you'll, you know, it can never escape, so mm -hmm. no, none of that light gets back out. But as gas is falling down into the black hole, it's colliding with other gas and it glows white hot and into the ultraviolet and even in, you get x-rays and it can outshine the host galaxy and that's what we call a quasar. So yeah. in the first year, Webb has been studying some of the, ho the galaxies that host those quasars to understand how did they grow so fast? How did they build a billion solar masses in a billion years down in the center? Webb has also been discovering uh, uh, supermassive black holes, accreting uh, black holes that we didn't know about that are just popping up all over some of these deep fields where we stare at a blank field, we find thousands of galaxies, and some of those, you're like, oh, that's, that's, another, that's, a, that's a quasar. There's another quasar. We've, they've been popping up all over. There are lots and of why are we so interested in studying them, quasars, mm -hmm. black holes? It's all part of the galaxy the evolution picture. It's all part of the puzzle. So actually, uh, you remind me with the quasars, often you do have to remove the quasar to be able to see the galaxy underneath, mm -hmm. and there are techniques to do that. But it's all about studying the galaxies and how they are forming and evolve. Well, we have another question from an, a Twitter user. Radio Casterful uh, asks, could JWST take a picture of Voyager 1 or is it too small to pick up on camera? Oh, that's a good, good question. question. All right, do math on the fly. <laughs> it's too small. It's too small. It's I too, don't too small. Think we, yeah. yeah, you can't do it. But I love the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah I know. That was an insightful question. Thank you. And we, uh, I'd have to actually do the math to work out whether you can get the reflection even if you can't resolve it. And I can't do that in my head. I'd have to go <laughs> get a pencil. Yeah, <laughs> knock up phone a friend. <laughs> yep. um, well, we have Maddie Lane on Twitter who asks, what temperature does Webb operate in in deep space? Well, we have two ranges of temperature. So we have uh, three instruments that operate in the near infrared and they are at about 40K, which is like a few tens of degrees over the absolute zero. And then we have MIRI that operates on the mid infrared, which means that you have to be colder to be able to detect that signal. So MIRI operates at about 7K, which is just seven degrees above the absolute zero. And that means that MIRI needs to have a special cooling system. It's like it has its own fridge, so to say, to keep it cool and really make it functioning. The other ones are, cooled down by the sun shield that protects everything from the radiation of the sun. Wow, the range is just... It, it is. <laughs> yeah. it and then is on the hot side... On the hot side, Right, yeah. the hot side yeah. where the, um, uh, below the, so the telescope and the science instruments all really cold, what, minus 400 Fahrenheit, 40 it's, degrees above absolute yeah. zero. On the hot side, it's like room temperature and hotter. So the, the parts that, like, you know, where we keep the computers and the radio that phones home, all of that is nice and toasty. Hmm. And then we have to keep that isolated from the cold side where we're doing the science. It's like hundreds of degrees difference between the two sides. It's really a fit. I mean, and it's just such a technological marvel, you know? Like, no wonder it took 20,000 people to do this. <laughs> really, one of the hardest parts yeah. of designing and building web was separating those two temperature zones. Very, you know, quite hot and very, very cold, and having the hot not bleed down into the cold. I mean, this is all so fascinating. And to those watching, thank you for such thoughtful questions. It really is a blast participating with you all in today's show. So please keep sending in your questions using the hashtag AskNASA or by dropping them directly into the comment box wherever you're watching today. We'll get to some, of the, some more of those in just a few minutes. Now let's take a closer look at the planets in our own solar system. Webb has shown us clouds and storms on Uranus and Neptune, as well as their ring systems, which appear to be way more prominent in infrared light. Maka, what can we learn from an image like this of Neptune? 
This is a beautiful image, and actually we have not seen Neptune talking about Voyager. We didn't see these rings, many of these rings, since the Voyager flyby in about, I think it was 1989. So it's been many years. Oh and so with Webb, we can really see in great detail all the rings. We can see seven out of the 14 satellites around it, and we can see all these bright, shiny spots, and those are clouds in the atmosphere that are made out of a, a material, a type of gas that is really reflective in the infrared, and that's how we see them that bright. So with Webb, we can see not only these theaters, but now there, there is more data, not only the first uh -huh. image. So astronomers are looking for more rings, the satellites we didn't see, and maybe even more satellites. So there's a lot of activity going on. And of course, at the core of it is like studying those atmospheres, those clouds, mm -hmm. those storms. How, how do they move? How do, what is the dynamic around the planet? And how do they evolve, essentially, year after year? So it's really... One would want, one could think, well, these are so close. Why do you need such a powerful machine? And the answer is because we need all this detail. These are the closest planets to us, so it makes a lot of sense to study them in detail and then to think, well, how does this fit with the exoplanets we talked about before? And I can only imagine that you know, the more detail we get, that must inform missions and things like that as well, right? Oh, so, absolutely, oh, exactly, abso absolutely, yes. and in part. The, uh, as Maka said, the last time we got a, an image of Neptune that go, that crisp, we had to send a probe all the way to Neptune. Yeah. Here, we're just, you know, the Webb telescope is not that far from the Earth. It's just pointed out there and seeing, uh, so it lets us look at the outer solar system without having to actually go there. And we're also, it also is informing things like um, places where there is activity in the outer solar system, like Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, mm -hmm. where we're following up on discoveries made by NASA's mission Cassini, which is now over with, but now we can go back and look and see, okay, what was going on that Cassini saw and follow up on it. Um, so that's something I, I think is one of the neatest discoveries so far, it really is. has been the, the water plumes coming out of the moon Enceladus and how there's this plume of water that is escaping out of um, cracks in the icy crust from what is presumably a subsurface ocean down there. And we're seeing that escaped water. And so Webb has captured that and has taken spectra, little rainbows, to see what it's made of. And so that was something where we didn't have that instrumentation on board Cassini, and but we could do it now after the fact, and we can visit all of the outer planets and the um, uh, comets, uh, uh, asteroids, Kuiper bed objects without having to send a probe. That is incredible. And so I do actually, what you said just reminded me, we had a few questions back we asked, um, I think about Webb's temperature in deep space. Mm -hmm. Webb is not in deep space, is it? So Webb is like about a million miles away yeah. from here. You would the consider Earth. it is? Okay. Yeah, it's it is pretty far away. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it's four it's times past the distance of the moon. It's further than humans have ever gone. Exactly. Yeah. Right? But compared to the distance of even Jupiter, it's not that far. So, yeah. you know, we say hi to it, and it's like less than a light second. It's not yeah. that far it's away. Close, that is and that absolutely. Is not, scheme at the but end. it's not like Hubble, which, yeah. you know, when Hubble is at its closest approach, it's only 300 miles over your head. Right? Yeah. So in that sense, it's a million miles away. Yeah. So, you know, if we're going to talk about ringed planets, we got to talk about Saturn. Yes. We Webb has Saturn. released an incredible image of this planet. And so other than just sheer beauty, mm -hmm. what could we, what can we learn from this image? Sure. You want to take that one? Sure. I mean, yeah. So again, the solar system experts, they call Webb a ring machine because they are seeing the rings of all these planets. It's a actually ring little and this I love yeah, that. it's like a ring machine. And um, so these rings are made out of dust and ices. And that is where with infrared and with web you can really see the details and you can really understand are there, you know, what, what are the satellites in the rings, what is mm. the composition and their dynamics and are there more rings we don't see? For instance, Enceladus is like a little bit farther away in a ring that is not the typical ring you see in the images from Saturn. So again, lots of data, lots of new information. And really, it, it's a fun fact is that the planets, they are so bright that the challenge with Webb is, is not to get too bright and then make the data mm -hmm. difficult to, to observe. So the challenge is, is really get good quality data in mm -hmm. a really, really short time. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. Well, I mean, it seems like it's knocking it out of the park. <laughs> and so before we move on from solar system, I do want to ask, you know, Jane, are, is there any 
other object in the solar system or anything else Webb has been doing sure. in the past year? Oh, gosh, we've been doing a lot. <laughs> um, and I don't have time to talk about all the comets and asteroids yeah. we've been studying. I do want to mention one asteroid uh, that we observed when it was hit by another NASA mission, the DART mission, mm -hmm. which on purpose slammed into one of a pair of asteroids that were orbiting each other in order to measure, can we move an asteroid if we needed to do that for, to protect our own planet? And so that was something that was a real stretch for our team. Webb was not built to track an asteroid that's moving that fast. That was three times past our speed limit. But there's a lot of cool science that we could do if we can track objects moving that fast. And so our team was really pretty eager for that challenge and embraced it. And in fact, we captured the, uh, the plume of junk coming out of that asteroid as it was hit by the DART, uh, by, uh, the DART uh, probe. So that's pretty neat. Uh, technically, it also lets us study, OK, what's, what's going on in there? And are, um, are they rubble piles? What, what is the composition? of these, uh, so we did spectra, we took rainbows to see what the stuff was that was coming off this, this asteroid. But I'm proud of the team because I know how hard we work to get that to, 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 get that to work because that thing was zooming past <laughs> and we're like, you know, having to move our telescope yeah. pretty fast. And to thanks to it. that, now we can move the telescope faster than we yep. thought about before launch. So we can do science of faster objects. That's Just incredible. Like that. yeah. I mean, like, talk about an all-star year for this <laughs> telescope. So it really is amazing to see what it's been accomplishing. And there are so many questions coming in online, so let's get to a few of them. As a reminder, to those tuning in live, you can submit questions using the hashtag AskNASA or drop them into the comment stream wherever you're watching the show. We'd also love to know, what has been your favorite web image from the past year? Post it online along with your question using the hashtag AskNASA. All right, our next question. Um, actually, this is a collective question. So we have a few viewers on Twitter who want to know more about the anniversary image. So they're asking, um, is what we're seeing in this image in the past? Yes. Yes, it is in the past. Can you explain how that's It possible? is 390 light years away in the mm -hmm. past, we, because that is the time the light travel, takes to travel to us. So. It is in the past, and actually everything you see is in mm -hmm. the past. When you look at yourself in a mirror, you're looking at a version of yourself that is like a tiny fraction of, mm -hmm. of a second, slightly younger than you are at that moment. So yeah, it's, it's light travel, and of course, the universe also expands, so depending on where you are, it might take a bit longer. But uh, yes, everything we look with web is uh, older. Yeah. It's just we're the nature. We're looking into the past. We're looking, yeah, yeah, but it's like the light from the sun is a slight into the past. We are looking at each other as light into the past. It's mind-boggling, you <laughs> know, is. to really like sit and think about that. And so, actually, this is a great follow-up question. Adam Up Updike on YouTube asks, has JWST changed our perspect uh, perception of the universe? And if so, how? Hmm. You know, not yet. Yeah, I'm going to go for not yet on Why? that one. I mean, yes and no, right? Like. It's gorgeous. It's lovely, but we we kind of knew that we were gonna like this. This is this is gonna yeah, knock people's socks off, right? Yeah. And yeah. I remember having to reassure reporters before launch about, well, are the images gonna be as good as Hubble's? And I just wait. <laughs> we'll sit back. No, don't worry. It's not gonna be a problem. Um, I would say that you know we are still getting started, and I would say that so far, for me anyway. What has given me confidence is that you know the data that we've gotten so far tells us, oh yeah, this is working great. Mm -hmm. This is, in fact, we can push harder than we thought. And so far, I think that we have, we, we know that we can push quite a bit harder. Yeah. I think maybe the, uh, we'll get to it, but I think the, the high redshift, the very, very most distant galaxies, where we're looking back in time, not just 100 or 1,000 or a million years, but we're looking back in time years. 13 billion years. years. For me, that's probably the part where that's changed my perspective, just because for me and for everybody else, before launch, that was a big old question mark. What did the first billion years of the universe's history look like? Nobody really knew. And that's the one area where we've gone from saying, well, we, we just can't, we can't do that with yeah. any telescope we have. We just hit a, a cliff where it's like, it's, you, 
we, we can't see that far back in time to where, oh yeah, we're finding hundreds of these galaxies everywhere we look. And that's the part where we've gone from saying, how did it all get started? How did the first galaxies form from, oh, we don't know, to, okay, now we have lots of data and we're really starting to figure out how quickly galaxies got their act together. I feel like, you know, that only probably opens up more questions, mm -hmm. right? So, but I think it's giving us new information in every area that and really informing everything. So I have a great follow-up to that. You know, Webb is, again, knocking it out the park. And so we have a few people asking, what was the original life expectancy for Webb? Yes. Um, and has it changed after this first year? So, can I take that? Yeah. So before launch, the life expectancy, so the requirement was five years. Mm -hmm. Before launch, um, with a fuel on board, et cetera, we, th we thought it would be 10 years. In la during launch, the launch was so optimized and so well done that we did save a lot of fuel. Wow. So now, if we think, we have to think about the limiting life factor, essentially. If you think fuel, mm -hmm. then it will last 20 years or more, but we don't know exactly what will be the limit and how everything will evolve. You wanna follow up? That's perfect. So, fingers crossed, so mm -hmm. that, that, it is, that it is the 20 <laughs> years. Um, mm -hmm. So we have an, uh, another collective. Uh, several y users on YouTube are asking if Webb has found life on other planets. Now, from what I understand, this is not a life-seeking mission, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, but that Webb looks for biosignatures. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us more about that? So the answer is no. Answer is no. Yeah. We have not yeah. found life on other planets. Yes. Yes. We'll let you know if that happens. Yes. Nor was Webb designed to do that. Yeah. That is a job for a future telescope. And in mm. fact, we are working on that. There is a design, there are, we're starting to design something called the Habitable Worlds Observatory, which would do exactly that. It uses a lot of the same technology as mm. Webb. It looks, you know, it has hexagons, it deploys, it, it um, but it, it looks at the at, at, at same light that we do, visible, and then ultraviolet light. Webb can't do that. It's an infrared telescope. There's just some basic limitations. We're not going to find life. And, it, and it's not looking for signs of life, No, right? that is not our science case. Mm -hmm. so what we could do is find places with Webb. We, can, we may be able, if they're out there and they're close, to find planets that could be habitable. Mm -hmm. that look nice and toasty, but not too hot, yeah. that have liquid water. But we, it, what Webb cannot do is say, yep, that one has life on it. Mm -hmm. That is a job for a future mission. It can say, this looks like a nice destination <laughs> that life might want to vacation to at. Study, okay. To study in the future. Yes. yes, and so, okay, thank you for that. Okay, so we just, we just asked viewers to share their favorite image in the chat. And now Chalkstar on Twitter wants to know, ooh, this is a good one. After a year, what is your favorite image from JWST? So. I must say I'm going to go with today's image. Oh, really? Before that, it was the Stefan's Quintet okay. with Midi. Uh -huh. uh, but I have to say the image from today, it is mind-blowing to me. It's, like it's ethereal. It like, is, exactly. Wow. It's so It's so organic and ethereal. It's like... Beautiful. And the one before was Stefan Squinted with Mary. Mm -hmm. I would have guessed that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to go with Pandora's Cluster, oh. um, which is a, a galaxy cluster. So thousands of galaxies all crammed into a space that in our neck of the woods is just a couple galaxies. Um, it is, um, so that's probably my favorite. The other one I really love is S Max 0723, mm. which is the lensing cluster that we revealed a year ago. Yeah. Uh, just because for that one, it was so beautiful, and it's, it's also the science that I do, so I was like, ooh, this is exciting, and it was also really easy. We got those data, we started, the telescope started observing around midnight, we had the data by breakfast. It was just one of these like, oh, oh, okay, this is, this, it's working really well. So that one has a special place for me just because it was a demonstration to the world of how, just, of how transformative this telescope is. Wow. If I may add, the yeah. Stefan Squinter, just to add context, uh -huh. is the image where you have a group of galaxies that are interacting yeah. and you really see how they, they have like this cosmic dance and they mm -hmm. sort of distort each other and in that process, you know, they may form a new galaxy. Definitely they may form new stars. So it is beautiful. 
I mean, thank you both too. And I know that y'all look at these images all the time. And so like, it really is incredible to hear which ones are y'all's favorite. <laughs> Um, so our next question comes from Mr. Spaquito on Twitter. <laughs> I know that's a <laughs> like it. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good handle. Um, mm -hmm. How much time do the teams at SDSCI and NASA take to publish Webb's data? So mm -hmm. starting from observing from the mm -hmm. telescope, mm -hmm. and then going through the whole process of analyzing and rendering them out, and then publishing. So, what's the timeline? Got so it. the the timeline it depends, right? So first of all, STSCI and, and, and NASA institutions um, don't publish data. Like there are scientists mm -hmm. that do publish data, but the way it goes, you take the data and then it gets downlinked. We have downlinks twice a day, uh, so it gets downloaded essentially, and then it goes through what we call a calibration pipeline, which is what Jane was describing before. You know, get rid of your electronic effects and the things you don't want from the data, and that is automatic and that is done at STSCI. And then once that process is finished then it goes into the archive. And then the investigator team grabs the data and they may say, oh, I'm going to fine tune this, I'm going to fine tune that, and then they have to analyze it and do their science. So it can be any time Depends. from, I've seen papers coming out in literally two days, and others take maybe six months, six months a, year. a year, it Depends really how, depends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you both so much for these answers to these questions. For those watching at home, we'll get back to some more questions in just a few minutes, so keep sending them in. So we've now looked at our own solar system, right? Let's go back in time yes. to when the first galaxies mm -hmm. were forming. Webb is a powerful time machine with infrared vision that is peering back over 13.5 billion years and is already providing the first look at the earliest galaxies that formed hundreds of millions of years after the Big Bang. So again, we're hearing a lot about Webb being a time machine of sorts. Maka, could you explain how telescopes can even be time machines? Yes, and this is nicely linked with the question we had before about yeah. in the past. So light is a wave and it travels. So we know it takes time to travel and it travels at the speed of light. So when the first galaxies and the stars, they emitted their life 13 and a half or more billion years ago, that light started to travel in time and space. And it did travel in a universe that is just expanding. And mm -hmm. in that expansion, that wave gets stretched. And in that stretching, it moves, for instance, from the visible light to the infrared light. It gets redder. And that's where Webb can catch it. It's really, it's really a beautiful process. So we are looking at a time of the universe we have never looked at before. With Hubble, we looked until about 13 and, and a little bit billion years ago. But there were other missions that looked even be, like behind that, the, the, like WMAP and COBE. But that time where the first galaxies and stars were formed, it's really new and it's really what we're looking at. We're literally looking at the edge of what Hubble did uh, and, and really pushing forward the limit. So it's, um, that's how it is at a machine. It's mind blowing. It is mind -blowing. It's honestly mind blowing. <laughs> and so, you know, Jane, but how can we really know how far away mm -hmm. any given galaxy is with so much accuracy? Sure, it's so convenient <laughs> that, so we take rainbows is the short answer. And very conveniently, there are little markers, little diagnostic kind of like, if you think about like CSI forensics, yeah. there's little fingerprints <laughs> of what different <laughs> elements and molecules are that just stand out. And you can say, oh, that's oxygen. That's carbon, that's hydrogen. And anywhere it is in the universe, you get these little little spectral signatures in the rainbow. And you say, well, that's, that's hydrogen, there we go. And so it's really helpful that those signatures are there in galaxies. But as Maka said, because the light has been red shifted because of the expansion of the universe, all we need to do is say, oh, there's hydrogen. I measure what color I see it at. I know what color it was originally. That means I know how far, how much the university is, has been stretched as that light was traveling to us. So it lets us take what we measure, which is a redshift, and then we use a cosmological model to turn that into a distance. So what it basically means is we get little rainbows of all our galaxies. We then can figure out distances to every one of their galaxies. And so if you think of like the, uh, take a, a deep field, like the famous Hubble deep field, where we've yeah. got hundreds of galaxies all peppered over an image. Getting these little redshifts means that we can we can make that into a 3D 
right? It's not a flat image like anymore. Pain, pain, pain. We can do, yeah, we know the pains, right? We can say, okay, this galaxy is these these are the ones these far away, and we can we can start making a 3D model of where everything is. That means we can start saying, well, okay, these galaxies we're seeing as they looked 13 billion years ago. These galaxies are as they looked 13.4 billion years ago. And these galaxies are 10 billion years ago. And so for any galaxy we look at, we get a snapshot. We don't live long enough to see galaxies evolve. We just don't live long enough. But we can, by getting all these snapshots, put together that, that picture of how galaxies evolve with time. It's as though we never got to see humans age, but we got snapshots of people at different stages of their lives. And from that, we can piece together how people are born, oh, I love mature, <laughs> and, and get old. Yes, That is a great analogy. So, you know, what is Webb revealing now that we could have never known a year ago, right? Can I do that yeah. one? Sure, go ahead, yes. <laughs> so, the big result, so there are a lot of results for the early universe. They're coming yes. out fast and furious. Yes. So the ones that I think that sort of, to kind of group them into some big themes. Yeah. So far we're learning that there are more galaxies at early times in the very young universe than we expected. That's cool. They're also brighter than we expected, so they're easier to study. Great. <laughs> There's lots of them. What we think is going on, and we're getting spectra of them, uh, and we're finding, so what we're finding is that galaxies formed earlier than we thought, and they are forming more stars than we kind of gave them credit for or, or thought oh, wow. we might optimistically get. Yeah. We didn't really know. Honestly, we had huge uncertainties in what we might get in this first billion years. This really was a, well, that's why we built the telescope, was yeah. to go find out. But the main result that is emerging is that there are more of these galaxies. They're brighter than we expected. I my interpretation of that is that galaxies just got organized early. And we're still working out why, their what together. the details, they yeah. just, yeah, exactly. The bars, they got, they got, cities. <laughs> so these are all still very small galaxies compared to the Milky mm -hmm. Way, both in terms of size and in terms of mass. But they have a lot of the properties of bigger, later galaxies. They've made some black, they, I'm kind of proud of them. They've gotten their act together. Yeah. They've formed black holes in their centers. They're, they're accreting gas. They're forming stars. So that's a little, OK, these processes that we see in the, the nearby universe are working in that first billion years. And so we're understanding how we're really getting a, a gorgeous view of how got galaxies turned on and got organized in the very early universe, which was the science case that sold the telescope. That's why we built it. And interestingly, some of them, they, we know now that they have stopped star formation. Or very pause, early. they're taking they a break. Pause, they're taking I a break. And maybe, maybe some of them will start merging with their neighbors and really triggering star formation again. So or maybe their black hole did it. We don't know yet. Black hole did it. We don't know. But then, that's a neat result. Yeah. Exactly. And that is how galaxies will evolve until today. Wow. So let's get to some more questions yes. from our viewers. Sweet. But first, we want to know where have you seen web images over the past year? With the mission's incredible window into the universe, I mean, we have seen pictures on clothing. <laughs> billboards in Times Square. Where have you seen Webb? Drop your response into the stream wherever you're watching. All right, so now on to some next questions. We have some Facebook users who are asking more about how we apply colors to the black and white photos that we get mm -hmm. from Webb. Mm -hmm. um, could you go into a little bit more detail? Yep, I can take that. Sorry. So as Jane was explaining before, Every instrument has a camera. Let's, uh, the, we call them detectors, but it's like a camera, mm -hmm. talking about images. And what the cameras detect, they do detect photons, they detect light. And in this case, we use filters to select which part of the infrared light. Think if it was visible, you would use a blue filter, and then you would get all the blue photons. It's mm -hmm. similar. You use a filter in the infrared light, you get those specific photons. So you take maybe three, four, five different filters, and then you order them chromatically. So your blue filters, you assign them the blue color on the visible. Mm -hmm. For the red filters, you assign the red color, and then in between. So that's what the um, imaging experts call uh, chromatic order. So they assign to each infrared color that we cannot see, a color that we can see. And it's literally just one by one, and then they combine them. And in that process of combination, is that space where you mentioned before that 
there's also art in this. Yeah. Because, you know, they really do this fine tuning of, oh, let's optimize this, what is more pleasing to the eye, and they come up with this really beautifully, highly contrasted images. But each of the colors, it's real, and each of the colors represents something. One will represent dust, the other molecular hydrogen, the other oxygen. It, so it is in there, and it really gives a scientific meaning to the image. I mean, you know the phrase, like, a photo is worth a thousand words or something? Webb is really doing this right it now, right? Really, like, yes. not only is it beautiful, you're just learning so much about the universe and just the connection of everything. So thank you for that wonderful description. We have another great handle. Mm -hmm. Tofu Eating Cat on Twitter asks... <laughs> A great question. Um, are there any opportunities for citizen community science with web data? Sure. That's a good question. Yes. So first I should say what citizen science is. Um, that is uh, efforts that are uh, efforts to get real interesting investigations um, that are done by large groups of people in the community who are not trained scientists. And there have been wonderful examples of this in all fields of science, ornithology, in astronomy. Um, and so for web, we are still actually working on figuring out how we wanna, what our strategy for that should be. All of the data go public. Some of them have a one year uh, period where they're secret except to the team that proposed that data mm -hmm. but after that year they all go public so we have a rich archive that anyone can access yes. and it really is fun to just start zooming around um, and start playing with the data yourself you don't need to be an expert to start uh, wrestling with and and making the same face that astronomers make which yeah. is the <laughs> confused <laughs> where, uh, you know the face as we're you know dealing with the real data so that's the, the short, so, so we're working on it. Yeah. And if you have ideas, let us know because that's something to, uh, for the future. Yeah, thank you. And so for those actually interested in citizen science at NASA, you can visit citizenscience.nasa.gov and explore some of our projects there as well while we keep our fingers crossed for maybe one in the future with web one day. So we have Twitter user Christine Kuga who asks, just how deep in the universe can Webb see as opposed to Hubble? So I guess, can we get a little comparison mm -hmm. um, on their distances? Maka? Yeah, I mean, Hubble was what, 13.23 billion years ago? Mm -hmm. And Webb is going 13.5 and beyond. So it's, what it feels like a small window when you think of the number, but it's really huge. In that terms of? Evolution of the universe and in terms of what happened there. Because that first billion years, a lot was a lot going did on. happen. Yeah. From you know, getting organized, getting yeah. organized, exactly. Get <laughs> all your stars together. <laughs> yeah. One of the results that's been so gratifying for me has been to see that with Hubble, we really could just look at the colors mm -hmm. and say, well, that's the right color red to be one of those very distant galaxies because it's a visible light. Well, right? Or and just we could we couldn't take spectra. We couldn't get the rainbows. You could just mm. get the colors and a couple filters. With web, we can get beautiful rainbows. And in yeah. fact, we can get rainbows for dozens of galaxies at the same time. Because the near-spec instrument can do, has this neat multiplexing. Where I want that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, all at the same time. And so with web, we're not only saying, yep, I know exactly how far away each of these galaxies is, but I know what they're made of, yeah. right? There's the hydrogen, there's my oxygen. Why is there so much nitrogen in that one? Yeah. which has been a puzzle in some of these, right? We're getting, out, we're getting both very familiar diagnostics and some that we're like, oh, I'm not seeing that before. Yeah. What's different about these early galaxies compared to galaxies in the universe today? So a really good follow-up to that. Um, Twitter user Aerospatial is asking, if Webb needs to take a pause after each image, essentially, is it true that Webb is always observing, always operating 24-7? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is always operating. I mean, you take an image, you take a pause, say, to switch your filter or switch your selection of, of, your, of your rainbow and then take another image. And then you finish to take data for your, say, row of Euclid. And then, then the telescope has to move to the next target. So while it moves, typically it wouldn't get uh, data from the sky, but it can get some calibration data and then it goes to the next target. So it is essentially observing all the time except when we do... Um, 
particular like uploading a new software mm -hmm. or taking a specific engineering data for you know mm -hmm. processing and understanding how things are going but yeah it is I would say 24-7 there are little pauses in between and then you have to get there to your target but usually when you go to a region of the sky you optimize it and you do all the targets that are planned for that particular mm -hmm. region it's safe to say it's working over time yeah well it is yeah it's just so constantly yeah. yeah constantly taking data and every week we give it a new plan for the next week yeah. mm -hmm. we schedule a week out and twice a day we say hi and, and get download yeah. all the data that it's taken in the last half of a day and even when it downloads data it keeps observing keeps going so right? it's very yeah <laughs> very efficient uh, the telescope that could you know so <laughs> we are running out of time but i do have one final question you know what's next What's next for Webb? Sure. <laughs> so we are exactly one year into our science yeah. mission. We have selected the science for year two. That science just started. We started observing that July 1st. And right now we're doing a mix of finishing the targets that we hadn't gotten to yet from the first year and starting the targets from the second year. And we'll do a mix of that. The first year will ramp down as the second year ramps up. We have, we're about to ask the world, all right, y'all, what are your best ideas for year three? We're going to ask that um, for uh, a deadline in the fall. And we're really just keeping it coming. And I think that one of the, th the things I'm really gratified to see is that the, the easy stuff came out in the first couple months. And now we're starting to see the papers that really took some analysis with a harder analysis, which gets to the more interesting results. So I think our big results are still ahead of us. That is so exciting to think about, too. And thank you so much, Dr. Rigby, Dr. Marin, for ta taking us through this journey of Webb's first year of science. I mean, I think it's safe to say that the best is even yet to come. I so do, yeah. uh, we really appreciate having you here today. Thank you so much. Really a pleasure being here and sharing this celebration with yeah. everyone. Yes, it's yeah. been fantastic. And thank you, and thanks to folks who've been with us on that journey. And you know, stay with us. It's, there's more to come. Yeah. And thank you to everyone tuning in online. I mean, I love that we were able to answer so many questions, and we really hope that you'll keep following the mission as Webb continues to peel back the curtain to the mysteries of the cosmos. To stay updated, follow NASA Webb on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can download the highest resolution images, videos, and other assets at webtelescope.org. Now, remember, and I cannot stress this enough, this is just the beginning. Webb's first year of science is an amazing start to what this observatory will continue to do as it transforms our understanding of the universe. To go more in depth on the mission, visit web.nasa.gov and make sure to follow along as Webb continues to unfold the universe. Thank you and see you next time.
hold it till I see it. Hey, it is! I can see it from here. It's orange. Wait, let me put my visor up. It's still orange. Sure it is. Crazy. Orange. I've got to dig a trench, Houston. Oh, 